Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Again, yeah. It's okay to say, say good morning twice, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, um, I wanted to mention a couple of things before I get into this. One of those is that next week I'm going to begin a new series of messages, and uh, it's going to be uh, called The Battle Zone. And what we're going to do is we're going to just learn about our enemy, and our enemy is Satan. And we're going to talk about some strategies uh, to overcome. We're going to look at, in the Bible and see what it says that we need to do. And so I invite you to come and just be a part of, uh, of a uh, five-part message series during the whole month of October called The Battle Zone. All right? Another thing I wanted to mention is uh, Monday at McDonald's, all right? Now, this is going to begin in October, so that's not tomorrow, okay? Uh, but uh, it'll be next, the next Monday, so October, I think it's the 2nd. Uh, I'm going to be up at McDonald's from 7 to 9, and that's not at night. That'll be in the morning. From 7 to 9, and anybody from the church is invited to pop in. Uh, I'd just love to meet you. I realize not everybody can be there. But uh, I'd love to have the opportunity to just learn about you as an individual, uh, learn about your family and things like that. So 7 to 9 on Mondays at McDonald's here in town, starting on October the 2nd. And I also wanted to remind everyone, last week I talked about that, about how I want us to begin to pray for God to do great things in this place, right? And so I just want to use that as a reminder that we need, we need to pray, and that needs to become a focus of everything that we're doing here at this particular congregation. Um, this message and last week's message are meant to complement one another. So I wanted you to understand that up front. So you might hear some common themes uh, that we talked about last week. You're even going to hear some of the same scriptures, but kind of like a good song. I can listen to a good song a lot of times. I can listen to the same scripture a few times too, right? Have you ever lost anything? Man, I have. Uh, sometimes my wife says, I think you left your brain at home, you know. But uh, I think we've lost a lot of things in life. Maybe we lost some information. Maybe we lost our keys. Maybe we lost our cell phone. Anybody ever lost the remote control? <laughs> And we're trying to find it in the house, you know. Maybe you uh, felt like that you lost uh, 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 just whatever it is in your mind that you know that you have lost before. I heard about this uh, elderly man. He was at the Super Walmart, and uh, he, had, uh, he had lost his wife, and he couldn't find her. And so he went up to this beautiful young lady and he said, uh, ma'am, I seem to have lost my wife. Will you just talk to me for a few minutes? And the puzzled woman, you know, uh, she said, well, why would you want me to sit here and talk to you for a few minutes? And the elderly man says, because every time I talk to a beautiful woman, my wife appears out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Finding what's lost, hey, can be really important. When I think about all of the things that people are trying to find in this world, shouldn't those very same people out there be able to find something of great worth and significant value in the church? Now, the world has a hundred million different things to offer, doesn't it? But what are we offering as a church that will help people navigate successfully through life? As we think about the church, okay, and the church is made up of people like you and I, right? And like everybody else here today. There are four specific traits that I really think anybody should be able to find at Warrenton Christian Church. Now, they should be able to find these at any church, but I want us to think about our church. Here's one of those things that I think people should be able to find. The church should be a place where people can find fellowship. All right? Fellowship. There was this mother who uh, had four kids, and uh, she was explaining why that they dressed all alike. Now, she said, you know, when we had just four kids, 
We dressed everyone alike in our family. You know, all the kids were dressed alike so that we wouldn't lose them. And now she said, looking at all nine kids, she said, now we dress them all alike so we don't pick any up that don't belong to us. <laughs> now, you know what? As you look around in this worship area today, you can look around if you want, but you know what? Uh, not everybody here at church today is dressed alike. Not everybody here at church today looks alike. But we are all family members, right? We are a part of a fellowship of believers because of our common relationship with Jesus Christ. And at the very heart of this family, at the very heart of this fellowship, love is something that should be expressed to one another. In the Bible, we find out that the second greatest commandment Jesus gave was love your neighbor as yourself, okay? And I don't know, maybe we should say love your fellow church member as yourself, you know? Now, that's for the whole world. I'm just putting it in our context today. Uh, Jesus also made this statement in John 13, 34 to 35. He said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men, and I'll add women, all men and women will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, when people come to Warrington Christian Church, they should be able to recognize that we are disciples of Jesus Christ by the way that we love one another. And you know what? If they don't find that, then we're not being the disciples that the Lord would want us to be. The church of Jesus Christ was never intended to be a feud, okay? It was intended to be a fellowship where we love one another. I've always liked 1 Peter 1, where it says in that text, it says, it's down at the very bottom there, it says, love one another deeply from the heart. In other words, you mean it. You really do love other people. In the Bible, we read how the New Testament church was devoted to several things. One of those was fellowship. Here's what it says in Acts 2.42. It says of the church that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, when you go back to the original language of the Bible there, that word fellowship is koinia. And that's something we've probably heard before. It's a root word. And it means sharing. It's also a word that can be translated fellowship, common, participation, and partnership. William Mounts, he said of this very word, he said, to the mutual, he says it refers to the mutual interest and sharing of members in the community of faith, the church. He says, in the context of the early church in Acts, which is where I just read from, such sharing involved not only associating with each other, but also sharing food and other necessities of life. Uh, Joe Ellis, he wrote a book a long time ago. In fact, I, I think it was one of the books that I had to buy when I was in college. It was written like during the, uh, the early 80s. And I think in that book, he has just a great chapter on fellowship. And here's one of the things that he said about this. He said, this quality, in other words, koinia fellowship, became the hallmark of the early church. The astonished world had never before seen such a relationship among people. Here was a group of people who sincerely cared for each other as much as they cared for themselves, who were sensitive to each other's feelings and needs, who were together and of one heart and mind. He says, in this remarkable relationship, Christians shared each other's hurts, weaknesses, personal problems, material needs, aspirations, prayer concerns, and victories. They associated in a climate of acceptance, openness, encouragement, assistance, support, and trust. And listen to what he says here. They became more truly brothers and sisters than if they had been born of the same human parents. It was as though, he says, their lives were welded together. Now, my wife and I, we have talked about this issue a lot of times over the years of ministry. 
And I really believe it to be true, at least for me. Now, I have family. Okay, you got family too. You may even have family that goes to this church. But I have, uh, I've, got, uh, I've got three brothers. Two of my brothers are also ministers. Um, I have a dad. My mom has already died about five years ago. Well, it has, it's been over five years ago. Uh, I have aunts and I have uncles. That's family. And I love my family. Don't, and I hope you love your family too. <laughs> you know, sometimes family can be hard to love sometimes. But you love them anyway. You know, I love my family. But we have talked about before how we feel closer to people in the church than we do our own family. And that's because I will spend a whole lot more time with people in the church than I will with my own family. And that's especially true like where you become a part of a small group. I've had a small group that's met in my home and you get really close to those people. And they become like family. And listen, when people find that kind of fellowship in the church, they're going to be able to navigate more successfully through life. Here's a second trait, and it's very closely associated with fellowship, but I want to bring out a little bit of a difference, and that is the church should be a place where people can find help in times of need. It's been a few years back, it was in 2001, that a 28-year-old woman was uh, perched on the railing of a 160-foot tall bridge in Seattle on Interstate 5. The woman was contemplating whether she should jump and commit suicide. The police tried to talk her down for three hours, uh, but to no avail. In the meantime, all traffic had stopped. And uh, it was a parking lot on the interstate. Associated Press reported that frustrated drivers who were stuck in traffic actually began yelling for the lady to jump. A police spokesman said commuters were coming by and urging her to jump. And that was on the mild side of what they said. He said, I'm not going to repeat the other things they said. Assistant Police Chief John Diaz said, we had motorists, truckers, people in a metro bus screaming for her to jump. And she did. The police were able to fish her out of the waters, but uh, she was in critical condition. A police spokesman said, obviously, when you have an individual in some type of crisis yelling for her to jump, is a very, is very insensitive to a person's life. I wonder how many times we've been insensitive to other people in the church. I wonder how many times we've been unloving to other people in the church. I wonder how many other times we've been uncompassionate, unwilling to help for other people even in the church. You see, the church should never be viewed as a group of people who lack sensitivity and compassion. In Acts chapter 2, verse 44 and 45, we learn the early church was described like this. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, it says of the early Christians, it says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up on meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. I guess they had people who didn't show up at church back then too, you know. <laughs> but it says, let us encourage one another. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, it says, Encourage, I'm reading uh, the very middle part. Encourage the timid, help the weak. In Ephesians 4.32, 
It says, be, compassion, be kind and compassionate to one another. In Romans 12, 15, it says, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. You see, one of the church's functions is to help others when they have a need. Now, it may be financial, you know, it could be a, a spiritual need in their life, it could be an emotional need, it could be a physical need. But what a relief to know, hey, that you actually have a church family that's going to reach out and help you when you really need it the most. I mean, I know that is so helpful. And that's what people should be able to find in the church, whether they are a follower of Jesus or not. Because we are here to be the hands and the feet of Jesus in this world. And you know what? By doing acts of kindness in the name of Jesus, we're going to be able to help people navigate more successfully through those very difficult days of their life. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Here's something else we can also learn. And that is the church should be a place where people can find the truth of God's word Proclaimed. This story goes back a ways because it was in the days when they served peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at school. Remember that? They don't do that anymore. But years ago, Martha Beckman, she tells how things were kind of in an uproar at their school. And uh, the cook decided to settle to serve peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch that day. Now, as the children filed out the door, Martha Beckman could hear one of the children say in a very satisfied voice, at last, he said, a home-cooked meal. <laughs> now, you know, at the church, we have potluck dinners. Hey, we had a picnic last night. Wasn't that wonderful? It was good, yeah. I know uh, the fried chicken was fantastic. And so was the cherry and the apple, and oh, the list goes on. But it was really good. But you know, one of the main things that we are to be serving up as a church is a spiritual kind of meal that is going to help instruct the mind and will actually help people um, to be productive in their Christian life. You see, the church, and central to that, is the proclamation of the truth. And sometimes the truth is hard to hear, isn't it? Sometimes the truth can cut. Sometimes the truth can make us go, wow, I really need to work on that. There's no doubt that all of us here today, and I include myself in that, but we all have certain struggles. I mean, I don't think there's a 100% perfect person in this room today. You know, and so maybe there are struggles with anger in your life. Maybe there are struggles with inappropriate words. Uh, maybe there are struggles with, you know, arrogance or, or lust or lying or greed. Maybe there are struggles with, with grief, the sense of loss, self-esteem. Uh, you struggle with forgiving people. You struggle with relationships, maybe patience in a dozen other areas. I just want to reiterate that help is available for your struggles when you look to the Word of God and you place your faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, when the Apostle Paul was saying goodbye to all the Christians at Ephesus, he had been there for a while and he was setting sail and uh, it's a very emotional moment in Scripture there. I'm reading from the message, and this is Acts 20, verse 32. The message is, uh, is uh, not a literal translation. Uh, it's a paraphrase. But I, I really like how it puts it there. It says, now, now I'm turning you over to God. Think about that. He's leaving. He's been a spiritual instructor, and he's saying, I am turning you over to God. Our marvelous God, he says, whose gracious word can make you into what he wants you to be and give you everything you could possibly need in this community of holy friends. When you and I come to church, we should be able to hear the truth of God's word proclaimed. 
I really think without the proclamation of the gospel in a church sitting, uh, the church is out of balance. Without the proclamation of the truth, people are going to have a much harder time struggling and a much harder time trying to overcome those struggles. Because we need power from God's Word. We need power from His instruction and from Him alone in order to do spiritual battle against sin in our life. Here's what Ephesians 6, 12 to 13 reminds us. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Listen, your struggle is not against your brother and sister in Christ here today. It is not against other people in the world. There's a lot of people who think that's the way it is. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but listen to this, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, it says, put on the full armor of God. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole full armor of God, but verse 17 does tell us that part of that armor of God is, quote, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So that's part of what we put on in order to win or to do battle against sin in our life. Because listen, the, the power to overcome your struggles will never be found in your physical strength. If you're trying to do battle against Satan based on your own physical strength, you are not going to win. Okay? It is not going to happen. If you are trying to get your life together before you ever decide to come to Christ, it's not going to happen. You are never going to get your life all together. Okay? That's the whole point of coming to Christ. You see, the power to overcome struggles is not going to be based on our physical ability, but it will be based in the spiritual power of Jesus Christ. It will be based in the power of His Word. It will be based in the Holy Spirit that he has sent you as you became a Christian and it is this spirit that helps you have a, more of a, a, a spiritual-based conscious as well as the power to overcome. G. Campbell Morgan, he once said this. He said, there is one sure and infallible guide to truth and therefore one and only one corrective for error and this is the word of God. You need the word in your life. You need to be in church, you see, because this is where part of that word comes in. Here's the last thing I really want to point out, and that is the church should be a place where you can find salvation in Jesus Christ. I got a picture that we're going to put up here. This is a picture of the Grand Canyon, and uh, it's just a part of it. But uh, I put it up there because we're going to tell a little story again. <laughs> There's a story about these uh, three individuals that they were together and they were looking out at this massive abyss of the Grand Canyon. And uh, there was uh, an artist and a minister and a cowboy. And as they looked out at the massive abyss, they all had a little bit of a different perspective, a little bit of a different viewpoint. And the artist looked out there and he said... What a beautiful scene to paint. The minister, he's looked out there and he said, he said, what a great example of the handiwork of God. And the cowboy, he looked out there and he said, what a terrible place to lose a cow. <laughs> hey, it's all a matter of perspective, you know? It's all about your viewpoint. And what is our perspective? Or to make it even more personal, is what is your perspective in the church when it comes to the importance of reaching people with the message of Jesus Christ? Is your perspective more concerned about, well, we got to keep that program going than actually people that we want to reach? Is your perspective more focused on maintaining traditions in the church at the expense of actually reaching people with different methods? 
Is your perspective more concerned about getting your way? I want my way. It has to be done my way. You know, listen, I like things done my way too, don't you? But I found out everything's not always done my way. Listen, I've, I've had people in church make threats. Well, if you're not going to change that, then I'm going to quit giving to the church. Well, if you're not going to change that, I'm making words up. I'm taking my toys and I'm going home. You know? And yeah, there have been people who have left the church even where I've been the minister. Can you believe that? <laughs> it happens. But uh, are we more concerned about getting our way than actually getting people to the church or to become Christians? I hope you really get what I'm saying. More than anything else, you see, people should be able to find that this is a church, okay, that is teaching them about salvation. That there is a way to God. There's a way to have your sins forgiven. There is a way to go to heaven. And, and here's that way. One of the last things Jesus said before leaving the world, it's Matthew 28, 19 to 20, and I read this last week. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You see, those words really describe how the church should be a center of evangelism that is consciously reaching out to others with the saving message of Christ. Here's a quote from Dwight Ozard. He said, The greatest mission field we face is not in some faraway land. It's barely across the street. The culture most lost to the gospel is our own, our children and neighbors. That's a perspective I don't want us to lose. Because when people are able to find salvation in Jesus Christ through the message of this church, they will be able to navigate so much more successfully through life. Let's bow our heads and let's pray today. Dear Heavenly Father, as your church, we just really have a desire. I pray that we would have that desire to become the person that you want us to be. Uh, Father, I pray that you are going to help us in that endeavor. I pray, God, that you would uh, help us to be a place here where there is genuine fellowship. And we're willing to help one another. And God, that this would be a place where your truth can be proclaimed. And where the saving message of your son can be found in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want you to think about over the course of the next two weeks, okay, over the next month, over the next couple years, as long as this church exists in this place, what will people find? What will they find? I really hope they find genuine fellowship. I hope they find a, a church where, hey, we're, we're willing to do what we can to help. I hope they find a church where the truth is proclaimed that the salvation of Jesus Christ is offered. Today it's possible that you've been looking for something for a long time. Maybe you can't really put your finger on it. Maybe you've been looking for purpose. You've been looking for satisfaction in life. And I just want to say, look no further, okay? Because there is one who cares for you. It's God and he cared enough for you that he sent his son to this world and he died on a cross for your sins. And he rose from the dead victoriously to prove that everything he ever said or did is true. 
And this one, this Jesus, the Son of God, he offers salvation. And you're going to be able to find exactly what you're looking for in the one who created the whole world. You're going to find it. You just got to be willing to make a decision, and it does take a decision, doesn't it? What decision has to be made? Well, you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You need to be willing to say, you know what, I'm going to turn my back on sin and I'm going to turn in a way that I want to live for Him. That's repentance. I'm going to confess Jesus as my Lord and I'm going to be baptized underwater so that all my sins can be forgiven. As a closing statement today, and I have it in the bulletin, this is something I want us to remember. And it's up on the screen. This is a takeaway for the whole message, okay? When I choose Jesus, and that means all of us in this room, okay? When I choose Jesus, I will be able to navigate more successfully through life. I want you to say it out loud with me, okay? Here we go. One, two, three. When I choose Jesus, I will be able to navigate more successfully through life. It's a matter of turning to him. Oh, that the world would listen and make that choice. We have our decision time today and our decision song. And listen, if you need to be making a decision, I just invite you to, uh, to go to the back over here or over here. There'll be some people there. I'm going to be back there. And uh, maybe you need prayer today. Nothing wrong with having somebody pray for you. Maybe you need to make a decision to give your life to the Lord for the very first time. Maybe you want to place your membership. Maybe you need to recommit yourself to the Lord. Whatever it is, feel free to come back. Let's stand and let's sing our decision song today.